Morning, church. Morning. 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 Uh, just a couple quick announcements. Um, this Friday, the 15th, I believe it is, uh, Good Friday, we'll be in Akron at Chapel Hill Church <laughs> with the Akron campus, uh, with Chapel Hill uh, as well. Uh, we'll be in their sanctuary and we will be uh, all in the same service. Ken will be giving the message. And then uh, next Sunday, which is Easter Sunday, we will be in Akron as well. Uh, we will not be in uh, Chapel Hill Church's sanctuary, but we will be in Chapel Hill Church's gymnasium where Ken will be sharing the message as well. So take note of that. That will be in Akron here on Friday and on Sunday. Um, yeah. What time on Friday? Um, do you got a time for Friday? No. Um, I do not. I should have looked that up. Um, you can go to the Facebook page, and I guarantee it's on there. Okay. So, All right. If any of you guys get on Facebook and check out the Really Recovered page, Just Really Recovered will take you to the Worcester campus. Really Recovered Akron will obviously take you to the Akron page. So. If you look at those pages, they'll tell you the dates, the times, the exact address of where to be. Uh, I know we don't mention this during announcement time much, but if you do not know, here at Really Recovered and in the church, uh, we have a culture of discipleship. We have a clear, intentional discipleship process that we take people through here. It's called The Way. Uh, we also have ongoing discipleship. We also have leadership development after that. We have loads of clear, intentional, structured discipleship to go through. And I just want to remind us of like what is going on here, because this isn't just some Sunday thing. Like what is going on here, I see the church. I see the community that God has formed here. And, and what we hope to see is the people in this community, the church, be discipled and devote themselves to being discipled. And we hope to see out of this that those disciples will go on to make disciples, right? That's why we have the initial discipleship process. That's why we have the ongoing discipleship <laughs> process. And what we're hoping for is as these disciples make disciples, Man, next thing you know, we're able to plant in a different location. If you do not know by now, we are in the process of planting in Mansfield. And there'll be some people from the Worcester campus that will be going out there. And so Jesus, he's building his kingdom. He wants to use us. And so uh, get aligned with what he is doing. And I encourage you, if you're not going through the initial discipleship process here, I encourage you to. I encourage you to start. Um, so let's pray. Hey, Paul, you want to pray first? Sure. Here's a mic. <coughs> yeah, Lord Jesus, uh, thank you for bringing us all together as a church today. And thank you for everybody that's able to be here and uh, the ones that aren't too. And um, pray that this message would be something we can convert into our own lives and uh, that, that uh, Jesus wants us to hear today. And. Um, Pray for your will. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Anthony sent me a verse uh, yesterday. It was out of Acts 2 when Peter is dropping the gospel at Pentecost. And, 
uh, he was uh, at one point in there, I don't have the exact verse in front of me, but it was talking about this, uh, the Spirit being poured out on us. Um, and Jesus reminded me of that this morning, because what we're about to sing about is the Holy Spirit. I know the scriptures say that if we know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give us the Spirit if we simply ask? And one thing I was praying for in my prayer time this morning for us, for the church, is that we would have a fire light inside of us today, okay? Um, that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we would have this burning within us to just follow Jesus and devote ourselves to his cause, and that we would be people that walk by faith and walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. So as we go into this first song, let that be your prayer, okay? <laughs>
So how are we doing? Well, I should ask us, how are we running the race? With endurance. Our purpose in every step. What if that became our culture that, you know, because you can confess that you've asked somebody before, how are you? And you really haven't been that sincere about it. Can anyone confess to that? I've been there. <laughs> I've been there. It's like, how are you? Um, just said that as a, just a, a filler phrase to get conversation going here. But what if our culture, um, it was defined as, as us sincerely asking each other, how are you? but with the implication, or maybe even the follow-up question of, how are you running the race? Is it with endurance? Is it with um, cheer? Maybe someone might go, I'm not running the race well today. And you might go, all right, well, let me pray for you. And if someone they might be like, I'm not running the race well today. My eyes aren't on the prize. My eyes aren't on Jesus. And he might go, All right, here, here's a verse that talks about that. Here's the word of God to encourage you. I think that should um, start to become our culture. <clears throat> Let's pray. It's good to be in your presence. And it's good to have a place in your kingdom. <clears throat> it's good to fellowship with your church this morning, to worship with your body. I pray, Lord Jesus, for perfect unity in your body. And I pray, Lord, uh, 
as your church, we would tremble at your word this morning. It's a big deal what we're going to be talking about this morning, Lord. It's your words. And so I pray that you would speak to every one of us. I pray that it would have a transformative effect on our lives, Jesus. That we would walk out of here <clears throat> with more of a fear of you, a deeper love for you, that we would be living a more consecrated life, and that we would run the race well, Jesus. And so we ask that you would take control, Lord, that in this moment my words would be your words, Lord Jesus, um, and that you would have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> so I know that I haven't given the message in a little bit. The last time I gave the message was February 20th. And I really enjoyed that message. <clears throat> and it's something that is kept on giving to me, um, just my time with the Lord. Um, I think about what I preached on on February 20th all the time. And if you were here, um, I hope you remember um, I talked about running to win and how, um, man, we've, those of us that have put our faith in Christ, uh, we've been saved. Uh, we've been saved from the penalty of sin and we've been reconciled to our creator and uh, we're being saved by the power of sin in our everyday lives through the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And one day we will be saved from the presence of sin altogether. And that is what our hope is in. It's in the glory to come. We are but temporary residents here on earth we are citizens of heaven and i went through a bunch of scripture just it was so powerful because we just read chunks of the word of god uh, that talked about our hope to come and how we ought to be living in light of that and i love that and, and, and it just it keeps encouraging me the lord keeps speaking to me regarding the passages that we went through um, and what I wanted to talk about um, in that message that I didn't get to, uh, I wanted, because we went through, man, this is what it looks like to live a faith-filled life. You know, th th this, this is how you'll be living. But what we did not get to talk about was, what doesn't it look like? And I know that all of us have lived lives apart from Christ, and so... We know that, but I wanted to go through the Word of God to go, what, what does the Word of God say about how, 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 to, how not to live a life um, that, that is um, where, where we don't run the race well? You know what I'm saying? What, what does that, what, what's a bad example is what I'm trying to say. And uh, we just didn't have time. We didn't have time to talk about that. But... I knew I'd get to preach again, even if it was a month and a half later, and so here we are, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But I want to start by uh, reminding us of the call of God. I want to take us to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verses 15 through 20. This is what it reads. Now listen, today I am giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to keep his commands decrees and regulations by walking in his ways if you do this you will live and multiply and the lord your god will bless you in the land you are about to enter and occupy but if your hearts turn away and you refuse to listen and if you are drawn away to serve and worship other gods then i warn you now that you will certainly be destroyed you will not live a long good life in the land you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessing and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. 
You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, and the other day, I was uh, going through a part of our ongoing discipleship with some of the guys. And that part of ongoing discipleship is, is called Called by Christ. Because what we do is we break down what is a disciple? What does that look like? And we know that a, a disciple is what? It's someone who's called by Christ to be in a loving relationship with Christ with the purpose of becoming like Christ while living on mission with Christ. And so we break those sections down in our ongoing discipleship and we talk about what does it look like to be called by Christ? And that's what we were talking about the other day me and a few guys, and it was such a moving time, and we were talking about the call of Christ, how it, it's a call out of the darkness into Jesus's wonderful light. For he said, if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness anymore, right? It is a call to be redeemed, to be really recovered. That is why uh, we are named really recovered, because a, a synonym of redeemed is recovered. And what Jesus wants to do is he wants to redeem us and give us a new nature and a new life, right? So that is what the call is. It's a call out of the brokenness, out of the addiction, out of the slavery to the passions and desires that are inside of you, the evil passions and desires that are inside of you. You guys know what I'm talking about. For Jesus came to set the captives free. It is a call out of the depression, out of the emptiness, out of that place, as Ken said the other day, of having a never-ending desire to be wanted. I want, you, I want to remind you of what Ken preached on just the other day as he went through uh, the 55th chapter of Isaiah and it starts off by going, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Can, come take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Peace with God, right? I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. So Jesus, he's called us, and he's called us out of that empty life, and he wants to satisfy the very depths of our soul. This call from Jesus is a call to have victory over sin and death, something you could never do apart from the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And I'll remind us one more time, it's a call to be reconciled to our Creator, a call to be in a loving relationship with Him and to be like Him and to live on mission with Him. And so we were talking about the call the other day, and uh, one thing... Uh, that we were talking about in regards to the call of Christ that for me was one of the most impactful things of our whole session was we were talking about the hope that is given to us when Jesus says, come and follow me and you respond in obedience. The hope that is given to us when we respond in obedience. There's a story in Mark chapter 10 of a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus, he's on the side of the road. He's so broken, he's been reduced to beggary. And Jesus is walking nearby. And blind Bartimaeus starts to call out to Jesus. And, and, and he goes, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he keeps shouting this. And people were like, shut up, dude. Like, like just, just be quiet. 
quit yelling. And what Bartimaeus did is he just started to shout louder. And he's like, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus notices him, right? And it's not, it, 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 it's not that Jesus just heard him yelling. Jesus knew Bartimaeus. Jesus initiated uh, Bartimaeus. He came to him, right? But Jesus goes, tell him to come here. And so what the people started to tell Bartimaeus, they're like, cheer up. He's calling you. Like Jesus is calling you to himself. And what Bartimaeus does is he goes up to Jesus and Jesus goes, what do you want me to do for you? He goes, I want to see. And Jesus heals him. And immediately Bartimaeus starts to follow Jesus. And I just want to remind you, coming out of that story, how blessed you are when you reach that place of beggary, like blind Bartimaeus. When you are reduced to that condition, that brokenness, where, where you are in a place where you are begging for mercy. Christ said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit and realize their need for me for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And what that word poor means, it means reduced to beggary. That we reach this inward state that parallels blind Bartimaeus' condition, right? And I just want to remind you of the blessedness of reaching that place. And so if you're here this morning and, and, and you're at that place, you are absolutely blessed. I often get on the phone with people who are calling to come into the sober-minded house and they're weeping and they're broken and they're crying out for help. And I always say, hey, I know that it's not the most comfortable situation you're in right now, but it's beautiful to hear the brokenness that you're expressing right now. And they sometimes they don't understand. They're like, I just don't want to be here anymore. And I'm just like, it's a beautiful place. Matter of fact, Jesus warns us in the scriptures not to drift from that place of need, right? But man, we are blessed when we're reduced to that condition of beggary. When you realize without spiritual life, you do not have life. When you realize this world is broken and evil, and you give up trying to put your hope in it. Think of that as the people tell blind Bartimaeus, cheer up, Jesus is calling you to himself. And we were talking about that the other day, and it reminded me of my broken condition. And I remember when the gospel touched my ears and pierced my heart, and I heard Jesus say, come and follow me. I have paid a high price to redeem you. Respond to the call by giving up your life to find life. And the hope that was given to me in that moment, I mean, in contrast to the hopelessness before that, think about that. As I said, when you come to a place where you realize this world is broken and evil and you give up trying to put your hope in it. Apart from Christ, that, that's the only hope that, that we have, right, is, is just in, in, in kind of what we can see. And, and, it, and it doesn't suffice to call hope because what hope actually is is a confident expectation. But how I describe it is like I would look upon the horizon for like what is that thing that's going to fill my soul? What, what is that thing that's just going to make everything better? What is that purpose that I just can't find to satisfy and as I would grab at things I felt like I was trying to grab wind that was just slipping through my fingers and each time I'm just like no matter where I look in this world in this broken world in the uh, as I look at the broken people in this broken world man there's no hope in sight until Jesus goes blind Bartimaeus come here come follow me and I remember when my heart was open to actually hear Jesus speak that. And the hope that was given to me in that moment, it's indescribable. It's indescribable. How beautiful is the hope given to us when we respond to the call. And Deuteronomy chapter 30 tells us how to respond. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 
What did it say? It said, I'm giving you a choice this day between life and death, between prosperity and disaster, for I command you this day, this day, right now, to love the Lord your God and to keep his commands, decrees, and regulations by walking in his ways, right? It says, um, oh, that you would choose life. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. That is what it looks like to respond to the call. Nothing less is responding to the call. And I want to remind you that a true disciple, a true disciple is someone who responds to the call to follow Jesus. They respond in obedience. They respond by giving up their life. They respond by denying themselves. They respond by uh, crucifying the flesh and denying their wisdom and their understanding. It's all garbage, and my life is given to you wholly, Jesus. I commit myself firmly to you. Man, when we do that, we are reconciled to our creator and we begin to have this loving relationship with him. We, we, we are transformed into his image and, and, and uh, we continue in this process of being transformed into his image and we live on mission with Jesus. And so we live in victory here on earth as we live under the reign and rule of Christ. But... I don't want to focus solely on that today. I want to point us to what I did the other month that we know ultimately our hope is in the glory that will come when all things are made new, right? Have you forgotten this? Romans chapter 8, verses 22 through 24. This is what it says. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. <coughs> and we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. When we were, give, we were given this hope, when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Right? Our hope is in the glory that is to come when all things for we know and again I say we are citizens of heaven we are temporary residents here on earth I've been reading I've been reading up on the martyrs uh, from back in the day um, I've been inspired by their testimony and, 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 and their stories and what's inspired me is the way they've lived out a passage of scripture I love. And the passage of scripture that these martyrs lived out was 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, 3 through 9. And I want us to take heed as I read this. says all praise to God the father of our Lord Jesus Christ it is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay and through your faith God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. 
these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. We know that we don't just put our faith in Christ once and then never trust him again. It's foolish to even say. The scriptures go, you must live a life of faith. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Let me reiterate the scriptures here. Through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation. And the way these martyrs lived, just it, 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 they just lived right out of here. The way they lived made you believe that they believed in this passage, right? The way they lived with great expectation showed that they really believed in Jesus, right? It wasn't a watered down false faith. It was a true faith and their conduct, their <coughs> conduct, excuse me, showed that they were truly followers of Christ. And as I was reading up on them, man, I, I was moved by how these people were characterized. And let me read a few things off of here uh, to um, show you uh, what the character of these people were. Right? So they were characterized as a people who had an unquenchable love for God. Right? Their souls were on fire far more intense than when their physical bodies were enveloped by flames as they were burned at the stake. These were many individuals. I was praying for that fire this morning in our souls. A fire that was far more intense than when they, in, when they died in the flames. They were a people that were characterized by truly fearing God and always thought about the honor of his name. They honored God not just with their words, but with their lives. This is a true witness, right? Acts 1-8 says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to be my witness, right? And it wasn't just with their words. Yes, with their words, they witnessed to Christ. But man, you could look at their lives, and their lives simply witnessed to Christ. They were a people who valiantly fought their way through the straight gate. What I mean by that is they embraced and journeyed down the narrow, difficult way. They were bold. They were courageous. And it wasn't their own courage and boldness. It was from the Spirit of God. Let me remind you of what Jesus said. He said, the gateway to life is narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. These people had constancy of faith. They were steadfast and went boldly onward to meet death. They were not terrified of death, even some of the most brutal deaths. As I read up on them, some of them sang aloud as they were burned at the stake. Some of them talked as they were going forth to die about the consolation in their souls of the presence of Jesus. How they were just clothed in the garment of righteousness and salvation. And there was just this, this sweet hope within them, this sweet consolation in them, because they loved Jesus and they knew what was to come, that they were being sent home. 
and this they showed through their lives. They did not falter in their sufferings. Instead, they rejoiced that God had counted them worthy to suffer for his name's sake. They were resolute to the cause of Christ. They valued the salvation of souls and put themselves last so others could be saved and win the heavenly prize. Let me remind you, as Ken does all the time, that we are to run to win. And that doesn't mean being first. That means being last. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, when the Apostle Paul is talking about running to win and running with purpose and running for a prize that will not fade away, right? It's in the context of him literally saying, man, I, I, I'll, I do everything so that some can be saved. The Apostle Paul says, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. And it's in the context of missional living. And then it goes into uh, verses like 24 and 25 through the rest of the chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where it talks about running to win and running with purpose in every step. Man, th these martyrs reflected 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and they put themselves last and they were resolute to the cause of Christ they, they, they sang out and they prayed out Jesus may your name be glorified and may your kingdom come that was the beat of their hearts they took to heart these passages of scripture God blesses you who are hungry now for you will be satisfied God blesses you who weep now for in due time you will laugh. And in another place, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God through much suffering and hardship. In another place, if we endure hardship, we will reign with him. And in another, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. They took to heart the word of God, and uh, their lives reflected that they truly believed in Christ. Amen. And before you say, well, that was the martyrs. Those are people that are extreme Christians. I'm different. That's not me. I want to remind you that they were simply human beings, just like me and you. Human beings that loved Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Human beings that rejected the, the futile pleasures and purposes of this world. They were human beings that responded to the call to follow Jesus. They were human beings that walked by the Spirit of God. They were human beings that ran the race well. And so, I'm just going to bring it back to this question, church, and I'm going to ask us, how are we running the race? And, and, and if you're confused uh, on, on like what the race is, it's, it's simply the Christian life. That is what it is. I'll remind you again that how we run the race will show where our faith really is. Do we look like citizens of heaven? Does our conduct show the fruit that is consistent with a life of true faith? <laughs> Are we holding tightly to the eternal life to which we have been called? The true <laughs> promised land. And so I told you at the beginning of this, I wanted to talk about um, what it looks like to not run the race well. We have some examples of what it looks like to run the race well. But what I want to emphasize today is what does it look like 
to be a bad example of this? What does it look like to not run the race well? To not walk by faith? To uh, not live in a way that is pleasing to God? And uh, what I want to use is the story of the Israelites and how they journeyed through the wilderness. Okay? And I don't want to bash on the Israelites. It's important to understand that. Rather, I want to take heed of the warnings that the New Testament scriptures give regarding the Israelites. Because there's a few passages of scripture where the scriptures are going, hey, I'm warning you, and I'm using the Israelites to warn you, don't do that. And so one of those passages of warning is right after 1 Corinthians chapter 9, as it's talking about run to win and running with purpose in every step. Check out the very first verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me read what that says. I'll read the first 11 verses. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them. And that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Verse 6, I emphasize, these things happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did, or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality, as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble, as some of them did, and then were destroyed by the angel of death. Verse 11, I emphasize, these things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. And so an overview of some of the Israelite story, because it was not all of them, it was a generation, right? And... Um, what happens is God redeems them out of Egypt. They're in Egypt. Um, they, they are oppressed uh, by the Pharaoh in Egypt. And, and um, man, they were, they were just in, in, in terrible uh, circumstances, um, oppressed. Um, and, and if you want to know, Man, how, how did they get to Egypt? You know, what's the backstory leading up to this? Just read uh, Acts chapter 7. The Apostle Stephen gives a really great um, account leading up to this. But they're in Egypt, and God looks down on them, has compassion on them, and, and says, man, I've seen my people suffering, and I am going to redeem them. And so he redeems them out of Egypt, uh, through uh, miraculous signs and wonders. He demonstrated his power. He parted the Red Sea, um, and he takes them into the wilderness, right? And so um, they, they journeyed through um, the wilderness, and, and where God was leading them to was the promised land. It was a land that was promised to them, um, it, it was a land that, in essence, symbolized perfection. And so you see them get redeemed out of slavery in Egypt. Uh, the promised land is the de destination, and they're journeying through the wilderness. And yes, it does reflect, like, 
like us journeying on our way to the eternal promised land. Yes, that, that is what it is symbolizing there. And that's why, um, man, we, we ought to take heed of what is going on here as we read the scriptures. Uh, but they're in the wilderness. God is leading them to the promised land. And as they journeyed, they rebelled. They did not run the race well. And because of their faithlessness and rebellion, uh, there was a generation that was not allowed to venture into the promised land, and they died in the wilderness. In other words, let me just not beat around the bush, they were condemned to the wilderness and died um, because they were faithless and rebelled against God, except for a couple people that were full of faith and trusted in the Lord. Let's go to... Um, Psalm 106, and instead of just walking you through tons of scripture that talks about um, the Israelites and how they journeyed through the wilderness, Psalm 106 captures this um, pretty well. It, it just, it, it'll be quick how we go through it. And so... I want to read um, verses 7 through 27. Um, and as we go, we'll break it down. So in verse 7, Our ancestors in Egypt were not impressed by the Lord's miraculous deeds. They soon forgot his many acts of kindness to them. Instead, they rebelled against him at the Red Sea. Even so... He saved them to defend the honor of his name and to demonstrate his mighty power. He commanded the Red Sea to dry up. He led Israel across the sea as if it were a desert. So he rescued them from their enemies and redeemed them from their foes. Then the water returned and covered their enemies. Not one of them survived. Then his people believed his promises. Then they sang his praise, verse 13, and this is where we'll pick up and start to break this down. Yet how quickly they forgot what he had done. They wouldn't wait for his counsel. And so the scriptures are going, man, they quickly forgot what God had done for them. And if you have time, and I encourage you to do so, read through the Old Testament scriptures regarding God's people and write down how many times it warns us and tells us not to forget the Lord our God. So many times, like, like I can't even count it, how many times it warns us not to forget God. And yet they forgot and, and, and it starts with, with who God is. They, they, they forgot who it was all about, right? It wasn't about them. It was about God. It was about his glory. It was about his purposes. And they totally deviated from that. They missed the whole point, right? And, and, and it supremely benefited them to be the people of God and, and, and to... Uh, submit to his ways to bring God glory and to live under his reign and his rule and, and just be an instrument in his hands for him to do whatever he wants to do with them. That was for their benefit. I want to remind you guys of that, that God's <laughs> purpose for our lives is, is, is better than any purpose that you can think up for yourself. <laughs> His glory is, is, is just as high as the heavens are from the earth. Like th that is what it is all about. That is why everything exists for the glory of Jesus' name. He is the subject of all of creation. And yet in the midst of this, they made themselves the subject. They forgot who it was all about. Um, Man, I want to remind you that the same God who saves you will sustain you. And man, they quickly forgot what he had done, even though, man, he parted the Red Sea and led them through. And many, many of us here would go, man, if I saw that, man, I would never rebel. And yet, um, man, I, uh, I, I know there, there's a lot that would. 
because we know that Christ has died on the cross. Like the, the ultimate redemption there, the price paid so we can truly be redeemed. And um, yet some make light of that as the Israelites did the Red Sea. The same God that saved you will sustain you. Is he not faithful to keep his promises? Let me remind you that the promised land, it, it was called that because it was promised. That's where it gets its name, right? It was promised by God, um, and yet they did not trust him. They did not believe. He is the only one who is trustworthy. He is the only one. That, 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 trustworthy means you're worthy, God, of our trust. And he is the only one who is trustworthy. Uh, they, they took their eyes off of his character, right? And, and it, it wasn't that they just had short-term memory loss and, and, and forgot the Lord their God. They deliberately took their eyes off of the character of God. A warning right now not to do that. Fix your gaze on who Jesus is. They didn't stay in this place of thankfulness for being redeemed by their creator. They just started to grumble and complain and make things about themselves. What it says in the second half of verse 13 is they wouldn't wait for his counsel. Right? At the end of Exodus chapter 40, what happens is they build a, a, ta a tabernacle, the d a dwelling place for God to live among his people, and it's completed. And there they are. They're, they're dwelling with God. Like, what more could they ask for? And it says at the end of the book of Exodus, I'll read it. It says, the last few verses, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. There the glory of the Lord was among them. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle, because the cloud that had settled down over it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out on their journey following it. But if the cloud did not rise, they remained where they were until it lifted. The cloud of the Lord hovered over the tabernacle di uh, during the day. And at night, fire glowed inside the cloud so the whole family of Israel could see it. This continued throughout all their journeys. Why I'm reading this is to emphasize that they were led by the Lord. And yet here it says they wouldn't wait for his counsel. They not only forgot who God was, but clearly they forgot who they were, right? Clearly they forgot who they were apart from Christ. And they started to rely on their own wisdom. They started to rely on their own understanding. They started to take matters into their own hands. Even though the Lord their God wanted to lead them and guide them every step in the way. A warning to us. A, don't forget who you are apart from Christ. A step without him leads to destruction. It leads to absolute chaos, for apart from Christ, we can do nothing. And do not rely on your own wisdom and understanding. The scriptures say, you must become a fool to be truly wise. Man, abandon your own understanding and submit to the ways of God. Do not take matters into your own hands. If that takes us sitting on our faces and not getting up until we're filled with power from heaven and in submission to um, the ways of God, then, then that's what it takes, right? So they wouldn't wait for his counsel. In verse 14, it says, In the wilderness, their desires ran wild, right? Let's not overthink this, church. They were self-indulgent, right? Their purpose, their pursuit wasn't about honoring God. It was self. I remind you of what Ken has taught us, that immorality is sensuality. 
They wanted what only gave them pleasure. All the while, they rejected the one who is the bread of life, the only one who could satisfy their very souls. They were self-indulgent, and it lists a bunch of things after that of just the, the destruction that is caused because of that. Verse 19 and 20. The people made a calf at Mount Sinai. They bowed before an image made of gold. They traded their glorious God for a statue of a grass-eating bull who had done such great things in Egypt. Or excuse me. They forgot their God, their Savior, who had done such great things in Egypt, such wonderful things in the land of Ham, such awesome deeds at the Red Sea. Right? So they started to worship idols, and they traded their glorious God for idols. At this point, the Lord, their God, wasn't Lord of their life. Rather, other things were. And my prayer as I spent time with Jesus this morning, and maybe you can write this down, maybe you can just take a mental note of it, tuck it in your heart, but I was praying that idols would be cast down in this place this morning. Okay? Verse 24, the people refused to enter the pleasant land for they wouldn't believe his promise to care for them. If you want to read this in your own free time, this is in Numbers chapters 13 and 14. And what happens is they get to the plains of Moab and right across the way is the promised land. And they're like, what? Before we go in, let's send some spies to scout out the land. And they'll scout out the land for 40 days. They'll come back. They'll give us a report on how good the land was. The spies went and, and, and scouted out the land. They came back and they gave a good report that, man, there, there's great fruit there. But there's some giants there too, you know. And the people, that they refused to enter the promised land. They, they grumbled. They complained in their tents. They were like, why has God brought us here to be slaughtered? And they refused to go into the land that was promised to them. I encourage you to read Numbers chapters 13 and 14 in your free time. There's been messages preached here out of Numbers chapters 13 and 14. I preached a message called Faith Filled Risks straight out of Numbers 13 and 14. I encourage you to watch it in your free time. But they refused to enter the land that was promised to them. And this is what I thought of when I read this, that those that won't spend eternity with Jesus, that, that was never really their destination. They refused to go into the land that was promised to them. And so when we think of people spending eternity apart from Christ, and they, they, they refused to go in and spend eternity with Jesus. They deliberately, actively refused by not loving the Lord their God, not trusting him, not committing themselves firmly to him. <laughs> Read the whole chapter of Psalm 106 in your free time. I'll end on this verse, Hebrews 3, verses 12 through 15. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For, for if we are faithful to the end, Trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says, and here's another New Testament passage. 
that warns us of the story of the Israelites and how they journeyed through the wilderness. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. Let's, let's pray, guys.